So when we talk about this, this inflammatory response here, Okay, remember we said it's the second line of defense, it's nonspecific. Um, this, is, this is where we have those three phases that kind of, th where we, you know, this is where we spent most of our time. Whoops, sorry. Um, so with those three phases, I wouldn't, this healing phase here isn't something you need to really worry about. It kind of makes sense. We'll talk about it later. It's really these two phases here, the vascular and cellular, that get really, um, really involved. Uh, and so we're going to go through those, not really, well, hopefully really quickly. <clears throat> so let's assume we have some kind of, um, so we have some in acute inflammation here, okay? Something has happened, regardless of that type of injury, whether it's uh, bacterial, it's, a, it's some kind of pathogen that has um, broken through that first barrier, or it's something mechanical, for example, a sliver or a stab wound or whatever, um, your inflammatory response is going to be the same. So you're going to have that vascular and cellular response okay so we're going to go through um kind of the steps of let's start with the vascular do not get scared by this giant uh picture here i'm going to go through what you need to know and otherwise you don't need to focus on um a large portion of it so don't 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 panic <laughs> um so the first thing that happens is we in the vascular response okay we're talking vascular response and again that's the vascular response, which is part of the inflammatory response, which is part of the second line of defense, okay? Um, the first thing that happens is we have this little bit of what they call transient vasoconstriction. Anytime you see, sorry, anytime you see the word transient, uh, it means it comes and goes quickly. You know that from, um, likely from a transient ischemic attack, right, or TIA. <clears throat> comes and it goes. So we have this transient vasoconstriction. It's not even really necessarily a part of the vascular response as much as it is your sympathetic nervous system's um, automatic kind of response to any kind of injury. So it's that fight or flight response that's kicking in and causing that momentary vasoconstriction. Um, it's very, very fast, um, like come and gone sometimes within two or three seconds. And then we're moving on already to this in more important, <laughs> really, um, aspect of the, the vascular response. And that is where um, uh, that cellular damage, whether it's bacterial or an actual physical injury, has caused or will trigger um, this fibrinogen, which is already in the blood. So fibrinogen is just... I think of it as a protein. I'm not even sure if it is a protein, but it's already floating around in the blood. Um, we, you can see here, I'm going to just zoom in a little bit here. Don't get freaked out because you don't need to memorize this. This is just, um, sorry, my computer keeps freezing. Just a way for you to kind of see what's, uh, what's going on. So we're looking kind of right here at this. Oops. Oh, bloody Pete. Sorry. Sorry, guys, I'm having a little bit of an issue. I don't know why my computer's kind of freezing up like that. Anyway, um, so the second thing, anyway, the second thing it's going to do, or the mo more important thing, is it's going to uh, clot at that site of injury. So you're going to have platelets that collect and clot at that site. And this fibrinogen is involved in that. It's already in the blood. Um, and then... You guys don't need to worry about all of this, but there's kind of this whole cascade that happens where thrombin comes in and it adds to the fibrinogen and then it, it creates fibrin. And what that fibrin does is it, um, it kind of strengthens that clot. So here you've got this, you know, these piles of blood clots. Um, but once that fibrin and those fibrin strands build up, you can see them in this picture, they build up around those clots. Um, I, I call it a spider web. It kind of creates this spider web around those clots and strengthens those clots. And that's actually um, the basis, that fibrin clot is the basis um, 
like the platform for future healing. That's where we're going to build our new cells on later when we heal further. Okay. So that's our second, really the big thing that's happening first. I, I kind of don't count this as the first thing happening because it's just so fast. But this is the first major thing that's happening in the vascular system. Um, just so you know, the, the fibrin, um, it, when I say it provides a, a like a base, um, it provides kind of like a, a surface for new capillaries to be built. Um, and when we, I think the word angiogenesis is in your uh, slide. So I just wanted to kind of go over that. When you see any word that ends in genesis, we're talking about the creation of something right anytime you see angio we're talking about blood or blood vessel sorry blood vessels right and angiogram is uh an exploration of the vessels in this case angiogenesis is the creation of new blood vessels this fibrin here is very very this fibrin kind of um clot is very very important for that for creating kind of a platform for that to happen so at the same time and it's very, very involved, so we won't go into how it's all happening. But at the same time, you have this, uh, these pro-inflammatory mediators that are released. Your slides talk a lot, a lot, a lot about histamine, which is great. Um, there are other ones that are also being released, things like prostaglandins, bradykinins, uh, leukotrienes. We'll go through those. But I think uh, what's really, really important when we talk about Histamine. I'm just going to go down, talk about histamine for a second. Histamine does these three kind of big things. And quite honestly, if you get stuck on an exam and you're not sure, they ask you a question about, for example, prostaglandins or uh, bradykinin or anything, and you're not sure what that quote unquote pro inflammatory mediator does, go with these three things because they pretty much all do these three things. First, they cause, um, they cause vasodilation, okay? No, no problems there. We all know what happens when we have vasodilation, right? They also cause an increase in the capillary permeability. Uh, what that means is the, the vascular system in that site, okay? So we're not talking about the entire system. We're talking about at that site, uh, where where that injury has occurred like it definitely can be systemic but for now let's talk about it at the site where injury has occurred you have this um increase in the ability for for things to pass through the uh outer membrane of the vessel or the venule right so capillary permeability means that um well, well, we'll we'll talk about what happens after. And then you have this third kind of aspect here, this smooth muscle contraction. You guys are really lucky because it doesn't come up really in any of your notes. So let's just skip it because um, we're going to focus on these two main things, this vasodilation and the increase in capillary or vascular permeability. So what's going to happen when you have that increase in, uh, in vascular uh, permeability, an increase in... Um, uh, sorry, and, and, and blood flow. So really when you have this, sorry, I skipped that, but when you have this, these two things, this vasodilation and capillary uh, permeability, you end up with hyperemia. Again, hyper, lots of, or too much, or over, and emia is always going to mean blood, right? So you have too much or lots of blood in that area. It's hyper, hyperemic or hyperemia. What happens when you have a ton of blood in, in one area like this, you can see in this picture, um, you have an increase in the filtration or hydrostatic pressure. So unfortunately, you guys haven't gone through the uh, fluids kind of unit yet. And I find that once, you, once we've been working for a while, this is something that kind of flies out of our mind. We just kind of know, you know which fluids to give and we're not really thinking about the pressures and what's happening. But we'll go through this in, I think, three or four, three or four units a little bit more closely. But for now, what we're talking about when we talk about hydrostatic pressure is the pressure that's exerted from the inside of the vein by, in this case, by this 
uh, this collection of blood and fluid and what and what have you the pressure against the outside it's pushing against the outside of that vein or the capillary really when it's pushing like that and remember we said we also have this capillary permeability which means it's more uh, susceptible to things passing through it normally it wouldn't these things that normally wouldn't what happens is all this pressure pushes um, the fluid out so out of the vein out of the vascular system um, out of the capillary and into this interstitial space or the tissue this is why we end up with swelling at the site of injury um, part of the reason anyway so when we talk about um, this uh, capillary uh, permeability, there's a little bit of a note in one of your slides that talks about an endothelial uh, gap. So if you look at this kind of picture here, and you imagine that this is like a, a slice of the the vein, right? This is this is the outside, and this here is one. <laughs> It's kind of silly, but it's one endothelial cell. Obviously, there would be way more than that. What happens is those cells, those endothelial cells, um, they contract. And when they contract, so they, they pull in, right? This is pulling in this way and pulling in this way. It creates these gaps in between the cells. And that's what makes the uh, capillary permeable. That's what allows things that normally wouldn't go through to pass to pass through and when you have again you've got all that pressure from the from the hyperemia that's in here sorry you've got all that hyperemia that's in here pushing against obviously that fluid is going to come out now there's one more thing that's going on in terms of those fluids and pressures that can get a little bit confusing um, we are hopefully going to uh, be able to explain that fairly easily Okay, so part of what's happening is inside of those, I'm going to use this, this kind of uh, drawing here. Okay, so this is again, it's just this is the inside, this is the inside of the venule, and this is the epithelium, and here's that gap we were just talking about. So what happens is that sometimes um, because of the, the damage that's been done to the area, the cellular damage, plus because of the, these growth and endothelial gaps. Some of the proteins that are normally here, for example, um, uh, albumin really is, is really what we're, we're talking about here is we're talking about albumin. So albumin will escape either through these gaps or it will escape just because this entire tubule is damaged, right? And so now you have these large proteins that are outside the vein, normally are in the interstitial space. So this increases uh, what's called your oncotic pressure. For the purposes of this like review that we're doing right now, just view oncotic pressure as the pressure that is pulling so it's pulling fluid out of the uh, out toward the large proteins. Okay, that's it's oncotic means it's it's uh, we're talking about large molecules or large proteins. Okay, um, oncotic pressure or uh, the the uh, extracellular oncotic pressure is because these giant proteins have leaked out into the extracellular fl fluid, and now they're now not. It's not just that you're having all of this hydrostatic pressure pushing against here and causing all of that blood to or fluid to be pushed out. You also have this pressure now that's pulling, pulling the fluid out, um, sorry, pulling the fluid out towards these uh, larger molecules of these albumin really. <laughs> um, and so that's kind of what, uh, what the, the book is talking about it when it's saying, you know, you have you have those two forces that are kind of working with each other to pull fluid out of the vein and into the interstitium. And when that happens, of course, you guys know um, you end up with whoops, so with um, edema, right? That's really what what edema is. So we're going to come back to this little kind of blood clot guy here in a second, but I just wanted to kind of when that happens, <clears throat> if you're pulling all of that blood or that extracellular fluid out 
what's left inside the vein? Well, what's left inside the vein is largely uh, red blood cells and so and larger proteins. But um, so in this case, your hematocrit would be fairly high, right? Your percentage of large blood, large red blood cells in that vein that's left over in that venule is going to be thick. It's going to be it's going to be high, so it's going to cause the blood to become very very thick and um, and viscous. And there are some other things that contribute to this this nitric oxide that's coming from phagocytosis, which we'll talk about later, so don't panic. And also um, during um, uh, the macrophage, some processes of the early, early processes of the inflammatory response, we are having nitric oxide released as well. And that's all contributing, we'll talk about it later, to this um, not necessarily problem of, but, but this thick kind of blood or viscous blood um, in that area. So that's really, you know, the overview of what's going on uh, in terms of the vascular response. So let's go back up here. So what we just talked about um, was this, again, the second line of defense, uh, the inflammatory response, and then underneath that you have these two types, the vascular and cellular. We just went through the vascular.